Hi, and welcome to the Michael Gardney Podcast, where my expert guests and I love to share ideas about success, money and wealth creation, particularly through property investment. Now, today I'd like to explore some priceless investment lessons from some of the world's most successful billionaires. These titans of industry have not only built immense wealth, but they've also mastered the art of sustaining it through savvy strategic decisions. And I'm joined today by Mark Creedon, founder of Mastermind Business Accelerator and CEO of the Metropole Property Group. And we're going to uncover how these billionaires' golden rules of investment can be applied right here in the Australian property market. So let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. In 1982, when Forbes magazine first began ranking the richest people in the world, the qualification to get into that top group was only 75 million US dollars. At that time, there were 13 billionaires on the list. In 2023, the last uh, Forbes result of the world's billionaires, the list now included 2,640 billionaires with a total net worth of $12.12 trillion, more than the whole Australian property market. Interestingly, in Australia, we had 139 billionaires. From property to the stock market to business to mining, they are all involved in some sort of investing. So today, with Mark Creedon, business coach to some of Australia's leading entrepreneurs and CEO of the Metropole Group of Companies, I want to discuss some of the investing lessons we can learn from these billionaires, including why they became so successful. Hi, Mark. Hello, Michael. Well, what I thought I'd do is come up with some of the the quotes, the thoughts of some of these people in this top billionaire list from Forbes and see what sense we can make of it. And let's start with somebody that we all, I think, admire what he's achieved, Warren Buffett. And he said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And we talk about this all the time. I mean, you can talk about it in the real estate market. We talk about it in the in in business, and um, it's the it's a, it's very important, isn't it, to discern between between cost and value? Yeah, sure. That makes a big big difference because getting good advice is an investment in my mind, not a cost. Just like paying for a good business coach has been an investment for me for the last decades, not a cost. No, that's right. And but I think the big thing is that you've got to get people to to understand the difference between the two. So they've got to start thinking about it in terms of value as opposed to thinking about it in terms of cost. So sometimes I guess, Michael, that's the difference between return on investment and cost of inaction. Interesting. So look, with property, people are looking for a bargain often. But in today's market, where there's few good properties on the market, if something is cheap, if something is unusual, in a very informed marketplace where uh, everyone's got much the same information, you've got to wonder, What's wrong? Why is that property cheaper than normal? And I guess the question then is, if other people are seeing something you're not seeing, just be careful. Yeah, great advice, Michael. Another person on the rich uh, list uh, of billionaires is Jeff Bezos, who said, your margin is my opportunity. What do you make of that quote, Mark? Yeah, I think he's talking about spotting and capitalizing on, um, on inefficiencies, whether it's in business, whether it's in real estate. And I think, Michael, it's about identifying opportunities where you can actually create value in whatever market you're working in. Well, there's an imperfect markets and perfect markets, well, more perfect markets. So in my mind, the stock market, Mark, is what I'd call a more perfect market where the share price of BHP for me is the same as for you, where I can get the same annual reports and I can get the same information and the same research. So, uh, And the information is widely available and one BHP share looks the same and feels the same as the same value as another. So that's a more perfect market. In the property market, it's what I would call 
stable and imperfect market where there's lots of information out there, but those on the ground, those in the know, uh, have an unfair advantage. Uh, they are able to get off market opportunities. They do know why one side of the street is different to the other, why one house is worth more than the other, even though from the street they, they look the same. Could be orientation, it could be other, other factors. And so, I love working in an imperfect market where I can take advantage of my insider knowledge and my contacts um, and also the opportunity to outperform the averages by uh, taking advantage of opportunities that are going to happen in the surrounding areas, changes, changing in zoning or actually just adding value through property development, Mark. Yeah, I think, Michael, that's where getting the right advice or having the right people on your team actually gives you access to that unfair advantage, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, Mark Zuckerberg, This I've pulled out a list of quotes from these very wealthy people, like him or hate him. He's been in the news a little bit lately. And one of the quotes he's famous for is, the biggest risk is not taking any risk. Yeah, I've never met a super successful person who hasn't taken risk, Michael. I don't know about you. Well, I haven't met any super successful person who hasn't failed. And I guess part of the reason you don't take risk is you're scared of failing. That's right. And, and in fact, we've also, and we've spoken about this on, on the podcast before, you know, we've, we've met people who haven't yet failed and we know they need to because that, that, that failure is actually a step toward their ultimate success. So we're not saying be frivolous, we're not saying take stupid risks, take calculated risks, take advice, but everything is potentially risky, even just getting in the car and driving to work or getting up in the morning. So therefore, it's worth understanding the risk and the potential reward. And I've heard it say that the the biggest risk is the things you haven't thought of. It's the risk that comes when you thought of all the risks. <laughs> the, the one that blindsides you. And it's really interesting because if we were, compl- I was about to say, if we were completely risk adverse, we'd just stay home. But in fact, the vast majority of accidents actually happen in the home. So there probably is no safe place from from avoiding risk totally. It's about being very careful about it, I think. Yeah. Charlie Munger, I think, passed away recently, but Warren Buffett's partner for a long, long time has a quote that says, the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. It's about patience, about long-term thinking. That works well in property, but in business and in all sorts of other things. Let compounding do its work. Don't interrupt compounding, he says. Yeah, without without trying to cross-promote, Michael, I actually just recorded a session on this for my podcast where I was talking about the importance of patience. So in business, not every, not every play is a try-scoring play or a goal-scoring play. So sometimes you just have to work through and be patient. And the idea is, to, is for each step to get you closer to the line or the goal or the outcome or your target, whatever it might be. But that's about patience. And I think the other thing when you said that, I was thinking something you always say is that it's always about the time in the market rather than the timing of the market. Because everybody wants to know, Michael, when's, when's the low point in the market or when's, when's the market going to peak? Yeah. Yeah. So no issue with cross-promoting because I listen to your podcast every week and I'd recommend everyone does the Mastermind for Business podcast, which is going to, I'll leave a link in the show note. And it is important for business people to understand that and learn the lessons I learned from my coach, from you. But I think also most people who buy investment properties should consider, well, not all people should consider themselves as small business people, as rental property providers. The tax department sees you that way. So you're running a business also. So you definitely get benefit from listening to Mark's podcast wherever you listen to this one. And hey, if you're in business, why not share the same business coach as I do? And Mark and Caroline Creedon help a group of Australian business people, entrepreneurs. Actually, it's a wide range of people that are in Mastermind Business Accelerator, aren't they? Yeah, it is, Michael. It's all about uh, people in service business and professional practice, but it's it's a wide range and quite deliberately. We know there's great power in the group. There's great, there's great wisdom in the group and there's great uh, power in this collective momentum that comes from it. Very much so. So you're getting one-on-one coaching with Mark and Caroline, one-on-many coaching uh, with, with Zoom sessions. And then I love the person intensives where there's lots of time to to get to know other people as well when you've got the cross pollinization of people from lots of different industries you come up with all sorts of innovations don't you 100 percent, absolutely sure so we got sidetracked from the quotes but i think it was worth just mentioning that uh, so michael bloomberg came in a with a quote saying and i hope i'm not offending anybody but in god we trust all others bring data. 
<laughs> it's a very American quote in lots of ways. But, I, but what it does talk about, I think it underscores the importance of data-driven decision-making, particularly, particularly when it comes to investments, Michael. Sure. So you shouldn't act on gut feel. Uh, in fact, most investors do. They basically say it looks good, it feels good, or it doesn't feel good. Uh, and, and many of them have this gut feeling. In fact, in my mind, uh, until you've been around a couple of decades and seen the ups and downs, you're not allowed to have a gut feeling. That's actually more nerves. Um, I have been around long enough to be able to see patterns in the chaos, but that's taken me a number of decades and lots of successes and probably even more failures to get to that point. So data evidence-based decision is important. The problem, of course, Mark, is who do you believe? Because only yesterday I got something in my Instagram. Look, Instagram must know I love property because in between uh, the other things I like looking at, I get all the paid, what do you call them, blogs, posts on Instagram. And, you know, Mark, I can actually make $250,000 this year on the side while I've got my real job without any money at all buying and flipping distressed properties. And another one told me I can actually buy 10 properties in 10 years and I guess somebody's going to come out and tell me I can buy seven properties in seven minutes, you know, from people who flipped hamburgers last year and now are property gurus. What are we doing sitting here recording a podcast, Michael? We should be out buying distressed properties and, mm. and, and turning them in 10 years. So be careful whose data you listen to as well. So he's right in to a degree. Be careful who you trust, I think, is what he's telling. And in, in today's world of social media, it's getting harder and harder to know who to believe. And I guess if we're having this conversation, and I hope we are, in five or ten years' time, AI is going to make it even harder. I only on the weekend sent you a little message from Donald Trump and it That's had right. his voice and it lip synced and he actually gave you a personal message. And if you didn't know better, Donald actually knew your phone number. So I'm a little bit disappointed now. So you're saying that wasn't from Donald? <laughs> I, oh, it worked. I, you see, I, I, yeah. I called you. So yeah, you you, did. be careful whose evidence you listen to. Can I just say the other thing too, Michael, just on that point is it's not just about who you listen to, but I think the great advantage of uh, the thing that I get from you is not just advice I get from you, but the advice I get from the people you trust. So you surrender. I mean, I'm thinking if you're talking about data, people like Simon Kirstenmacher and Dr. Andrew Wilson. And, and so being able to tap into those people, I trust them because I know that you wouldn't have them working with you if you didn't trust that, that, their data. An interesting thought. So it's not just who you know, it's who, who you know knows. Carlos Slim, who actually isn't that well known in Australia, but uh, always ends up on the world international rich lists. And we're looking at lessons, priceless lessons, the investment lessons we can get from the influential billionaires and Forbes rich list. He said, the key to success is not about making money, but about investing it. It's interesting because you talk about we can we can make money by selling a property or alternatively, we can leverage off a property and we can reinvest into it or we can use that leverage to invest into another property. We can renovate that property or we can diversify into other investment classes. But it, it's it's the concept, I think, of, of using that investment potential or gain to actually create further investments and therefore and therefore more wealth. Well, we see this a lot. There's a lot of people who've made millions of dollars over their life because they've earned a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, even a hundred thousand dollars a year, but they end up at the end of their working life with very little to show for it. So it's the old story of spend less than you earn, save. When you've saved up enough, use that as a deposit to invest in something and then use compounding leverage and time to work. So making money is a very, very different skill to investing it, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then keeping it is another skill again <laughs> uh, but because uh, you, you've got to have the right protective buffers in place, not just finance buffers but the right ownership structures and the right people around you and the right insurances as well. So Carlos Slim's concept of the key to success isn't about making money but investing it, I'd agree with him. Richard Branson, I like following Richard Branson. I'm impressed with his story. He said, business opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming. I bet you that's something that you'd come across a lot with the people in Mastermind Business Accelerator. 
all the time. And in fact, um, I actually recorded something about this on a, on a podcast episode just about two days ago. I think the thing about it is that there is always opportunity. And so you've got to be careful not to rush into those opportunities. And it's a matter of balance because you've got to, you've got to wait for the right opportunity, but you've also got to make sure that you're not waiting. I would add to that, it's okay to wait for the bus as long as you know the bus actually is coming. That's right. Well, wealth is the transfer of money from the impatient to the patients, another good quote from Warren Buffett. But also, I think I've often said I've made more money by saying no to perceived opportunities than yes to them, because there's always opportunities around. So, just wait for the right one. How do you get the right one? Well, how do you know what's right? And that's basically by having a plan, by having a strategy, knowing is this opportunity right for you at your stage in your investment game? Because I'm, let's be blunt, playing a different investment game too. You're very successful. You and Caroline are very successful property investors, but I'm a decade older than you or more, and I've got a bigger asset base. So I'm doing things differently to you, and you're doing things differently, having done it for decades to somebody who's just starting. So really, what bus am I catching? Is it going to get me to my destination? And my destination's different to yours. So that's really important. And that's why at Metropole, we always start by putting a plan, a strategy together and helping people plan to become the people they plan to become. And now maybe we can actually include and that will teach them the right bus to catch. Well, that's that's right. You know, the interesting thing, though, Michael, is that, that it's it's about the bespoke nature of that plan, because it's very easy for, to, for somebody to say, oh, I can put a plan and you could download, you could download an investment plan off the internet for free. But that plan for me will be the same as the plan for you and the same as for, for Pam and Caroline and everybody else that we know, as opposed to the strategic plan that we put together in Metropole, which is very much bespoke around what it, where that person is right now and where they want to be, which bus they need to catch to which destination. Yeah. Interesting. Oprah Winfrey said, do what you have to do until you can do what you <laughs> want to do. That makes sense. Yeah. Of course it does. You've got to start small. You've got to, I mean, in property investment, you've got to start small and grow big, but it's true of, uh, Michael, how many businesses have we seen go belly up, unfortunately, because they've, they've tried to leap a tall building in a single bound or conquer the world in, in, in one moment? I was just reading about stretch goals. Uh, last night out of the Harvard Business Review and it was talking about how one of the biggest mistake people make with stretch goals is they start from either from scratch and try and create a stretch goal or they start from a loss and try and create a stretch goal and and, and it doesn't work. Sure. So Oprah said, do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. The suggestion is do what's appropriate for your stage in your investment career back to what we said a moment ago, understand what game you're playing and don't take advice from others who are playing a different game. Mark, at the moment, I'm seeing quite a theme of let's invest in commercial property. And you know that Pam and I have got quite a number of commercial properties, but I also often share my biggest mistake. One of my biggest mistakes in the 1970s was buying two great properties in Dandenong Street, Dandenong uh, factories that were leased well, but didn't go up in value because I was playing the cash flow game when I should have, in fact, been playing the cash capital growth game. Now, today, commercial property is very appropriate for me at my stage in life. So start what you, with what you need to do to get you to where you want to go, is I guess her message. Now, Ray Dalio said diversification is a powerful tool for managing risks. I know a lot of people talk about diversification. That's much harder to do with property, with real estate initially, because it's lumpy. A bit easier to diversify in shares you can buy ETFs, which invest in a whole range of investments, or you can buy shares in different companies and property because it's expensive and lumpy. It's not as easy. And I know that, in fact, Warren Buffett and others would say the opposite. Diversification leads to averageness. Uh, that's what financial planners will tell you because it keeps you safe, while successful investors actually do the opposite. They they specialize. They find something they're very good at. Look, you, you know, a bit about my portfolio and personally, while we've got a lot of properties, the ones in Melbourne are in four municipalities. Yeah, I've found yes. areas that work. Why am I now going to go to other areas that don't work? So I am now diversified with houses, townhouses, 
villa units, apartments, commercial, industrial, residential. But it took a long time to be able to build my portfolio to get to that level. So I sort of agree with him and I diversify in different states and I know you do as well and you've got different types of properties. So when your Brisbane properties won't do as well and they do, well, at the moment it's the other way around. Your Brisbane properties are doing well and your Melbourne ones aren't. Uh, but it was a different way around a year ago which allowed you to go to the bank and say, hey, look, just refinance these ones. So no doubt diversification is useful but also specialisation has its place in my mind, Mark. Yeah, I think, Michael, this is a great example where it's about getting the right advice because diversification for the sake of diversification can lead to all sorts of dramas, I think, but diversifying for the right reasons, whether it's you know to, to minimise land tax or to minimise exposure or whatever it might be, makes sense to me. But I think, again, it's the matter of making sure that, that we get the right advice, the right people around us. Well, I picked some names from the Forbes Rich 500 list and Elon Musk came up, not surprisingly, and one of the quotes that he has put out was, when something is important enough, you do it even if the odds are not in your favour. That sounds like Elon Musk though, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> I'm going to send just... somebody to Mars even though the odds yep. are not in my favour. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I, in the Harvard Business Review I was reading the other day about about stretch goals and, and it made the comment that uh, Elon Musk set up 10 stretch goals, eight of which he missed completely. But the two he hit were amazing. So I think sometimes that it's that it's that if it's important, you run with it, even if the odds aren't in your favor. Again, as long as you, you were to put this in context of all of the other advice as well, calculated risks, diversification, getting the right advice, getting the right people around you, et cetera, Michael. Well, most people tell you to set goals that are smart. Um, I've forgotten what the acronym stands for, but it's something that's easy to do and you're certain to be able to get there uh, and it's measurable and it's tangible. In fact, in my mentorship program, I tell people to do the opposite and to reach for the stars for exactly the reason that you said, because while you may not reach the stars, you'll reach the moon. But for you to be super successful, you can't just do simple, easy, tangible goals if it's important to you, which is what Elon Musk said, when something's important enough, you do it even if the odds aren't in your favour. Yep, I like that. Larry Ellison came up with the comment that great achievers are driven not so much by the pursuit of success, but by the fear of failure. Now, when we speak to people at Wealth Retreat, uh, we, we find a lot of them are driven by very similar things, aren't they? And, and fear is one of the things that drives us, but it's got to drive us in a positive way. Yeah, I think that's right. And I'm far be it for me to, to necessarily take issue with Larry. But I think the, the great achievers I've known, Michael, uh, are driven by both the pursuit of success and the fear of failure. Because the problem is, if, you, if you're only ever driven by the fear of failure, you're always running away from something. Whereas if you're driven by the pursuit of success, you're running towards something. And I think really successful people have both of that in their, in their armour. Yes, Okay, one of my favourite quotes from Warren Buffett is somebody sitting in the shade of a tree today because somebody planted a tree a long time ago. And he's got a couple of points there. Think long term. The quote actually forms the foundation, the foundational pillar of how Buffett invests. He's got a long-term investment. This average Australian thinks about what's going to happen this weekend. Most investors worry, what's going to happen to interest rates in six months' time? When are they going to go down? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to unemployment? But the very successful business people we deal with, uh, they think a 10, 15, 20-year time horizon. So to me, 10 years is short term, 15 years is medium term, and over 20 years is long term. And, and so that fits in with Warren Buffett's thoughts, because property investment's not a get-rich-quick scheme, even though, as I said a moment ago, there's plenty of people on the internet willing to sell you their secrets about how to get rich pretty quickly. <laughs> Well, I often say the the quickest way to get rich from a get rich quick scheme is to sell a get rich quick scheme. Don't ask me to say that again. <laughs> yes, yeah, I do. I did. I had a very popular blog on the on the internet. A little graphic I put on saying, "If you give me two dollars, I'll actually sell you my report on how to make a million dollars on the internet overnight." <laughs> <laughs> very uh, yeah. true. But the thing about property investment, like most things, Michael, is that. It really is a marathon, not a sprint. We talk about this in, in Mastermind all the time as well, that business is a marathon, not a sprint. Your business can be your cash cow to, to help feed your property investing. But if you think that it's going to be an overnight success, and I guess it's a bit of a common joke, a lot of successful business people you talk to and they go, yeah, it only took me 25 years to become an yeah. overnight success. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So, and unfortunately, social media magnifies that 
doesn't it? It makes people sound like they're doing it really quickly. Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, obviously a very, very big company in the United States, says, ignore the conventional wisdom. If everybody else is doing it one way, there's a good chance you're going to find your niche by going exactly the opposite direction. And that's the same with property investment. If you listen to who everyone else listens to, you're going to get the same results. And we know that 92% of investors never get past their first or second property. We, in fact, know that 50% sell up even before they get to three or five years in, in, in their portfolio journey. So Australia's full of unsuccessful investors. Don't get caught following the herd. Mm. I was just thinking as you were saying that, you know, if you did listen to everyone else, to, to who everyone else listens to, I mean, M- Michael, I'm thinking about all the people that bought in mining towns during that boom, or people who bought apartments off the plan in the cities during that boom, people who bought regional properties for cash flow regions. I mean, when that big push was on and everybody was jumping on the bandwagon, and I remember having a conversation with a family member about mining town and they were saying, oh, do you, you know, we should buy a property together in a mining town. And I said, oh, why would we do that? And And their answer was, well, that's what everybody's doing. We need to jump on the bandwagon. Good point. So the answer is don't do what everyone else is doing. Mm, I like it. Warren Buffett came up with a quote that's frequently quoted, and he says, we simply attend to be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy only when others are fearful. So what he's talking about in some ways is buying counter-cyclically. I don't fully agree with that, but I guess he's in a different way saying don't follow the herd. Yeah, I think that's what he's really saying is don't don't do it just because everybody else is doing it. Yeah. He also came up with uh, the interesting comment that the only value of stock forecasters is to make fortune tellers look good. But it's same with property. Uh, if you were trying to time the market, listening to all the experts, the Reserve Bank, all the big banks got it wrong last year. So I have expectations more than forecasts. But you and I are good friends with Andrew Wilson. Interestingly, he does seem to get his forecasts more right than others. But it's a tantalizing prospect to think that you know when things are going to change. It's not as simple as that, is it? No, it's not. It's it's a bit of a joke, Michael. When if I go out with our our business partner Brett Warren, you know, I introduce people to Brett as the the national director of property with Metropole, and one of the questions people always always ask is, it's one of two. It's either, oh Brett, can you tell me where the next hot spot is, or oh, Brett, um, when do you think the market's going to bottom out? Can you tell me the bottom, you know, the bottom point of the market? And you know, it's he's same thing. Is well, I'm actually, you know, I'm a, I'm a property expert. I'm not a fortune teller. So. Mm. Hey, that's a clever line. Now, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner, said, waiting helps you as an investor, and a lot of people just can't stand to wait. If you don't get the deferred gratification gene, you've got to work very hard to overcome that. And that's something I commonly talk about in my Mindset Moment in the podcast, the importance of delayed gratification. It links into what we were saying before about patience, the value of patience. I mean, delayed gratification and patience, one and the same thing that it's it's a matter of not necessarily being in a, in a hurry and it aligns i think with that long term planning that we that we've spoken about earlier as well michael sure so i think one of the questions you should often consider is what can i start now what can i do now that i'm going to be thankful for in 10 years time that i've done today so as it goes back to what we were saying earlier on that successful investors and successful business people have a long term focus so maybe as a listener to this podcast, just ask yourself a question. What would your future self thank you for if you did that today? Now, interestingly, it's too late for people listening to this because wealth retreats come and gone this year, but uh, why not set aside the last weekend of April next year? But that's the sort of thing we talk about at Wealth Retreat where it's very powerful to think of where you're going to be in five or ten years' time and ask yourself the question, What can I start now that I'm going to be thankful that I did in five years' time? So, Michael, it's a bit like you when you started your podcast. Well, interestingly, I first started a podcast with our joint friend, Kevin Turner, in the early days when very few people were listening to podcasts. And then five years ago, I uh, swapped to six years ago now to setting up my own podcast. And interestingly, I've had some great guests and We've had over 6 million downloads in, in that time, and it's a significant driver of our business, but it's a great way of me getting the message out to as many people as possible. Winston Churchill said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. At Metropole, as we've said a few times, we've delivered hundreds of strategic property plans for clients, and I can see 
how it's helped them create lifetime wealth, but it's actually the planning process, Mark, that actually trumps the plan. It's not the document, it's not the piece of paper, which keeps changing with time. It's actually more important the fact that you you sit down and you know where you're heading and then you implement what you have to do to get there. And I think the other thing too, Michael, is that not only do we do we create the plan and create the implementation process, but we then review the plan and update the plan. So it's because it's constantly evolving. This this entire journey of life and wealth is constantly evolving, isn't it? Yeah, and the market keeps changing as well. So the plan should list everything that you require, time, money, the planning to, to achieve it. And as I said, it's more the process of it. But it, Metropole, uh, it's not just the plan to buy a property or that's not a plan. The property you eventually purchase should be the physical manifestation of a whole lot of decisions you make and make in the right order. And that's what the plan helps because it's actually a structuring plan. It's a finance plan to get you through to buy you time, not just property. A capital growth plan is a subsection of it. A rental growth plan is part of it. For some people, a development and evaluating plan is part of it. And the end goal is really then not the property, but the lifestyle it gives you. So therefore, part of this also has to be how you're going to eventually get the freedom and the choices you want. And that's why at Metropole, if before we start talking about property, we start with a plan. But most clients come to us and have two questions. What can I buy for my money and what are your fees or where should I buy? And in fact, we don't even talk about property till we know which strategy, which plan is appropriate for the client. And then, as you say, we regularly review it. So let me throw a quick add in if you're interested in getting a plan to help you plan to become the person you plan to become. I don't know how often I said plan there, Mark. (laughs) Uh, Then why not go to metropole.com.au and find out about us? We're much, much more than buyer's agents. We're big enough to tip the scales in your favour, but still small enough to care. And even though we've got offices in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, we help people from all around Australia and overseas, a lot of expats, and we've got our own on-the-ground teams, but a huge research department. It's more than the research, though. It's actually the perspective, I think, that we bring to the party, Mark. I think that the perspective plays the, the big role, and it gets back to what I was saying before, Michael, that the, these plans are, as you say, it's ultimately it's to help people to grow their wealth through property, but in fact, initially, it's not even about property. It's about understanding where what, where people want to be and what's the process that we need to help them to put in place to achieve it. Well, most people don't have the right peer group around them to help them and they get the information from the internet. And the most expensive information, of course, is the information you get for free that's wrong. So why not get our team, Mark and my team, around you to help you grow your wealth, metropole.com.au. Lots of good information there from those billionaires, Mark. I look forward to listening to the Mastermind for Business podcast, yours every week, and also uh, catching up with you again in about a month's time. Yep, sounds good. Talk to you then. Thanks, Mark. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'm going to ask you, well, in a moment anyway, to imagine it's all gone. But first, let me explain that I like to think I'm an optimistic person. I am. I tend to believe things are going to work out. Of course, impartial scientific analysis of the world for, I guess, over the last 5,000 years tends to support this thesis. It works out. I also believe that to be a good investor, you've got to be optimistic. You have to have an unwavering faith in the future. However, I recently came across a technique that is, in some ways, the opposite of thinking things are going to work out. It comes from the Stoics, and apparently it's been around 2,000 years. So I figured it's worth paying attention to anything that's been around for more than 2,000 years. And this technique I want to just talk to you about in this session is the technique of negative visualisation. Now, negative visualisation is about imagining that you've lost all the things that you value. Your home, your job your sight, your ability to work, your husband or your wife or even your children, they're all gone. Now, it's easy to have an immediate aversion to thinking this way. What do you want about, Michael? Aren't we supposed to think positively and therefore manifest all the things we want to in life? Well, bear with me. Some of you may be thinking, well, doesn't negative thinking tempt fate? Well, apparently the Stoics believe absolutely not. They say, Premeditation malorum, which translates as something like premeditation of evils, has a huge benefit. 
Now, the Stoics used it to ward off hedonic adaption. That's our tendency as humans to quickly get used to the things, good things and bad things, in our life. I don't know, let's give an example. Buying a new car, you get temporary happiness, you get a boost, you get excitement. But after a short period of time, many of us sort of return to a baseline level of happiness, don't we? Now, unfortunately, this can lead to a constant dissatisfaction and an ability to step off the treadmill. You keep looking for more things, don't you? On the other hand, imagining everything you've got has been taken away from you, well, that induces feelings of gratefulness. Now, William Irvine writes in a book, his book was called A Guide to the Good Life, most of us spend our idle moments thinking about things we want to, but don't have. We'd be much better off to spend this time thinking of all the things we have and reflecting on how much we'd miss them if they weren't ours. Interesting way of thinking, isn't it? Another benefit of negative visualisation is that by anticipating disaster striking, we're more prepared for it when it does. I guess we're psychologically toughening ourselves up, aren't we? Now, fingers crossed, disaster's not going to happen. And we don't need it to happen in order to have the benefits. Many people who go through a catastrophe report feeling joyous, feeling thankful, feeling grateful to be alive after having the experience. I'm sure you've heard those stories yourself. But we can't wait. We shouldn't wait for disaster to strike in order to feel that way. As William Irvine explained in his book, negative visualisation can be done repeatedly and the benefits, well, they can last indefinitely. He said negative visualisation is a wonderful way to regain our appreciation of life and with it, our capacity for joy. Now, I'm not saying stop being optimistic. Of course not. And I'm sure the optimists do better than pessimists in all areas of their life, including in relationships, including in business and investing. But I do think trying this as an interesting experiment is worth a go. You know, I really felt the benefits when I tried this exercise, the exercise of, for a moment, imagining losing everything. After thinking about Pam not being by my side, I had to go across to her and tell her how much I love her and how much uh, I cherish her being in my life. And when I next saw my grandkids the next day, I hugged them a little harder and a little longer. Now, I know you might be thinking, what a way to live walking around with all those pessimistic thoughts. That's not what I'm suggesting. In fact, I'm suggesting that at least once a day, you should think of two or three things you're grateful for. Every morning when I get up, I look for two or three things I'm grateful for, and I can't use the ones I used the day before or the day before that, because I believe in this, you are grateful. You'll never truly be wealthy. Now, we normally characterize an optimist as somebody who sees the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. But as I was reading about this concept, I learned that the Stoics, though, to them, this degree of optimism is only really the starting point. After expressing his appreciation for the glass being full, or half full rather than empty, he actually then go on to express his delight in even having a glass. I mean, it could, after all, have been broken or stolen. So I'm not suggesting go around all day contemplating potential catastrophes. Of course not. But I do suggest that periodically, every now and then, you should actually maybe pause in the enjoyment of your life to think about how all this, how all these things could be taken away. It's brief, it's practical. Furthermore, there's a difference between contemplating something bad happening and worrying about it. Now, contemplation, I guess that's an intellectual exercise. It prevents us from taking the world for granted. This is a powerful philosophy that, that can carry through into your financial life as well. Now, I've often talked about Morgan Housel, one of my favourite authors who writes for the, well, used to write for The Motley Fool and now for The Collaborative Fund. And he explained in his book, and it's a great book that I suggest you get, The Psychology of Money. I've got it on my Kindle and I love reading it. Morgan Housel said that to be financially successful, you need a barbelled personality. You need to be an optimist about the future, but paranoid about what will prevent you from getting to the future. He said you need to save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist. So financial planning, and uh, at Metropole, we have actually two separate financial planning licenses with uh, 
Ken Race, our Wealth Advisory Division, uh, does financial planning, but also uh, Spark Private Wealth, the uh, company that uh, does financial planning, is part of the Metropole Group as well. And I learned to some degree it really is similarly a, a process of negative visualisation. The Answer the question of how much life insurance you need. You really have to work through the scenario of you're not waking up one day. And at the same time, you need to acknowledge that it's a possibility to get an estate plan in place, as Ken Race does all the time. We really need to talk about how you want to look after your loved ones. But when you're gone, again, acknowledging that one day you're not going to be there. To think about liability insurance, you need to talk about how disaster can strike to earn the luxury to invest in what can go right, you first have to protect against what could go wrong. So by going through the process of negative visualisation in our financial life, we can prepare, we can plan, and we can balance optimism with realism. So as Morgan Housel said in his book, you can be optimistic that the long-term growth trajectory is up and to the right, but equally sure that the road between now and then is filled with landmines and always will be. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. So, in summary, be optimistic, be grateful. But why not just try that exercise? Imagine it's all gone, and then all of a sudden, I believe, like I was, you're also going to be more grateful, and when you're more grateful, you're going to be much, much wealthier. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?